Hello, welcome to CIR Brazil Moment at uh, Arbitration Channel. I'd like to again thank Lauro Parenti and Arbitration Channel for the opportunity for CIR Brazil uh, to have this uh, uh, this, uh, this moment to uh, discuss some um, uh, important issues of dispute in, in the area of dispute resolution. As you know, um, uh, the uh, uh, CIR Brazil uh, moment takes place um, every week until the end of September, and from then on, every other Wednesday. Uh, and uh, and we we are here. Uh, myself, Cesar Pereira, uh, 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 a member of the uh, CIR Brazil uh, branch board of directors, and Cristina Mastrobono, a uh, vice chair of of CIR Brazil branch to welcome uh, our guests uh, in Ryan Robertson and Anthony Damesis uh, to this uh, week's uh, episode. And the, uh, the purpose uh, of this interview is for uh, all of you uh, to meet uh, some of the faculty members uh, that will be here uh, with us either in person or virtually uh, in, in October for the uh, Brazil Branch uh, Fellowship Program, uh, a, a one-week uh, program uh, that intends to um, qualify uh, arbitration practitioners, uh, uh, arbitrators, and, um, and, and people that are involved in dispute resolution as fellows of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. And we, uh, we will, uh, today, uh, we will discuss uh, with our guests, some of the aspects of uh, being a fellow of the Chartered Institute and being involved in this very intense and very rewarding uh, program. Um, before we move on, I would like to briefly introduce uh, to you our our guests. Um, in Ryan Robertson is a chartered arbitrator and a fellow of the of CIR. Uh, she is actually the immediate past president of CIR globally. She's an international partner at Lock Lord, uh, at Lock Lord's, uh, Lock Lord's um, Houston office. Uh, she acts as arbitrator and advocate in a wide variety of complex uh, business disputes across numerous industries. Uh, she uh, has received many awards and honors, and I would uh, highlight uh, most recently, uh, she was selected by the United States Department, Department of Trade as one of the 10 arbitrators appointed by the United States to serve as, dis as the uh, as dispute settlement panelists uh, in accordance uh, with the uh, US-Mexico-Canada agreement. Uh, she's a, m a member of a number of arbitral institution uh, panels, uh, including ICDR, uh, CIOC in Singapore, HK HKIAC in Hong Kong, a AIAC and CPR, uh, she's an adjunct professor at the University of Houston Law Center, Center in um, as a long established uh, supporter of diversity in arbitration and is also a founding member of Arbitral Women. And uh, we also have here with us um, Anthony Damesis. Anthony Damesis is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of, of Arbitrators. Um, she, uh, he has had uh, over 20 years of experience in arbitration, uh, sales law, and contract law. Um, he has been teaching at the University of Ottawa uh, Faculty of Law uh, since 2003 and uh, has appeared uh, before Canada's Supreme Court on arbitration contractual matters, including the top court's uh, Uber case, and most recently, um, addressing issues such as separab separability in its role in insolvency proceedings. So, uh, um, as I said, Anthony and, um, and Anne uh, will be uh, some of our faculty members in October, and uh, uh, you will have the opportunity by participating in the fellowship program of interacting uh, with them uh, during this very, um, very intense program. I will now turn to my colleague, uh, Cristina Mastrobono, uh, who will start uh, with the questions uh, for this interview. Thank you. 
Thank you, Cesar. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want first to thank uh, Lauro Parente for giving us the opportunity to bring some uh, questions about the fellowship program to the ones that are interested. And I thank you, Anne and Anthony, for giving some of your time uh, to allow us to give this information. Uh, and I have to say, uh, you are a role model for a lot of women that uh, are intending to work with arbitration, my at least, <laughs> and I thank you very much for being here. So I will start with you. And you are the immediate past global president of the Chartered Institute. You were also a trustee and chair of the North America branch. So uh, please tell us a little bit about your impressions of the Charter Institute after your presidency and the role being involved with the Charter uh, and the role being involved with the Charter Institute has played in your career. You're on mute and it's not a there we go. It's wonderful to be here with you again. And I thank you so much for um, that uh, introduction. If I could, Christina, I will start with the last part of your question first, which is uh, what role the Chartered Institute has played in my career. And I would say that uh, I owe my career to the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators because when I made the transition from litigation to arbitration, I was looking for a way to make that transition and the Chartered Institute supplied it. First, by my taking the courses, which uh, we've already mentioned, the fellows course is coming, but I did the members course. I did the fellows course and I must tell you, I hadn't really even heard of the Chartered Institute. At the time, it was just happenstance that I met the then chair of the North American branch who told me about the Chartered Institute. I took those two courses and then got involved and I urge everyone to get involved in the Chartered Institute. And as you noted, then I became the chair of the North America branch and then the trustee. And then I was so, so very fortunate to be the global president this last year. So my impressions of the Chartered Institute is, well, it's a very large, uh, organization with over 18,000 members worldwide. And a lot of us have a tendency to think of it very narrowly instead of realizing that there's this enormous network of people across the globe, all of whom have been trained by the Chartered Institute and all of them who have similar values and similar impressions about arbitration and mediation and the best way to fulfill it. I find that the Chartered Institute is actually even more dynamic than I thought it was when I was, before I was president, because as president, I got to kind of peek behind the curtain and learn about all the various activities that go on around the globe, not only on the branch level, but on the level with uh, uh, Bloomsbury Square in London. So for anyone who is interested in a dispute resolution practice, alternative dispute resolution practice, be it in arbitration or mediation, I simply cannot endorse the Institute more strongly than I just have. It is an excellent organization. Thank you very much. And now, Anthony, I will turn to you. You are an academic with an impressive career at the University of Ottawa. Uh, what I would like to know, if the most time of your time outside the university, is it dedicated to work as a counsel or do you sit as an arbitrator? <laughs> do you think joining the Charter Institute as a fellow has made a difference in your professional activities? Well, first, let me also thank uh, everyone for, for inviting me today to join uh, in this discussion and also to act as one of the... Uh, I don't remember the correct term, but tutor or facilitator for the upcoming event in, in Brazil, although I'll be doing it virtually. Uh, Brazil has always, I've always had a nice bit of good luck with Brazil. I don't know, every time Brazil is, is in my world, something good happens. So I know this event's going to be wonderful. Um, as far as the questions you asked, um, you know, there are ebbs and flows where sometimes I do more council work than arbitrator work. But I would say it's probably in the range of 60, 40, 
uh, 6535. Uh, just this morning, I was appointed as a sole arbitrator in a, a commercial case. So again, I think there, whenever Brazil's involved, uh, something good happens to me. Uh, so that's that's more or less what my practice is. Um, I have the the good fortune to have a day job as a professor. And so I tend to be a little bit picky about the cases I'm going to take. I usually do it more out of interest or if the area is, a, is an area that uh, is, is trickier than others. So that's more or less how I come about uh, making those decisions. And certainly joining the Chartered Institute as a fellow has made a difference because the exposure that you get just by having that um, designation, it's more than just a few nominals. It really is that you're meeting people and you know it works in both directions. When I see that somebody has that designation, I already know something about the person. And I believe it goes both ways, which is why the nominal is important. We all know that we would have had to write an award. We would have gone through uh, the training and uh, most importantly, made those connections with, with other fellow fellows. Um, thank you, uh, Antonin. I would like to um, um, ask uh, Anne uh, a, a question about something that actually follows up on uh, what uh, Anthony was saying. Uh, a key aspect of CIR is about ethics. Uh, from um, a professional ethics standpoint, uh, what, what is, in your opinion, uh, the meaning of becoming a, a fellow? Uh, in your, uh, something related to what uh, Anthony was saying, in your practice, in your international experience, does it make a difference to see someone uh, is a CIR fellow when you meet them or when you think of them for some ADR related roles? Absolutely. It does make a huge difference. And the reason it makes a difference is because if you are a member, simply a member with a lowercase m of the Chartered Institute, you are subjected to their code of ethics. And their code of ethics of the Chartered Institute sets forth basically how one is to act and to make certain that you are acting in in accordance with best practices in dealing not only with other members, but also the public at large. And anyone, even someone that's a member of the public at large, can bring a claim against a member for failing to adhere to the ethics. Uh, I always like to give this experience, a personal experience of mine that follows on what Anthony had to say, but it's not in relation to uh, meeting someone at a conference, which obviously I agree with Anthony. If you meet someone, you already know that they've been through those same rigors that you have and are subjected to the same ethics that you are. But in fact, it relates to a personal experience in which many years ago I received a letter and it was a fax. So that tells you how many years ago it was. And it was someone looking for a lawyer to represent their client in court in Houston, Texas. But this letter came from a country that is known for scams. So I threw the letter in the trash. But as I was throwing the letter in the trash, I noticed that the person who wrote it had FCIR after his name. So that gave me some comfort. So I contacted this person and it turns out I was hired for that case. It was a case of first impression in Texas. We ended up making new law at uh, the Texas Supreme Court. And it was without a doubt one of the best pieces of litigation I was ever involved in. And it was all because this person had FCIR behind his name. So that shows you the power of the post nominals. Thank you, Anne. Uh, thank you especially for sharing that, uh, that story. And uh, uh, Anthony, um, going back to your academic uh, background, uh, how, how do you see the CIR fellowship course as a learning experience uh, for the participants? The faculty members like you and, and Anne are there much more as discussion leaders than instructors, really. And so uh, uh, why, why is the ARF so praised by its participants? Well, I, I think it's it's because while you're absolutely right that we're more discussion leaders than, you know, than instructors, 
we all, all of us, the those who are attending to take the course and those who are the um, discussion leaders, we're all learning from each other because, of course, everybody there is experienced. They all bring different kind of experience. But I know each time I have acted as one of the um, discussion leaders, I've learned something either because I never knew something from a certain jurisdiction or I never really thought about an issue from the perspective that one of the attendees thought about it. So it's constant learning from both ends. Now, of course, as the uh, discussion leaders, in principle, we, we probably have a few more experiences that are more or mostly relevant for the issues that arise. And so the those who are taking the course, I think, get the chance to really um, hear about perspectives that are different from reading it in a book. Books give you a lot of great information, but naturally cannot give you the kind of hands-on, in-the-trenches experiences that a lot of the discussion leaders bring to these courses. So it is really um, an, an incredible learning experience, whether you're the instructor or the the candidate. And um, I think why it's so praised is that it is really one of those atmospheres where you're learning in the best way possible by bouncing ideas off each other, by really thoughtfully thinking about issues that come up and having experienced folks giving their uh, perspective. And it's not always a perspective that you have. I think it's an important way to learn where somebody gives you a, a thought that you never really contemplated before. So I think that's why that program is so special, so much more, so much different from a course where you're just sitting and listening to a lecturer like me drone on. <laughs> okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, now turning to Anne. And Accelerated Route to Fellowship is an assessment for more experienced um, uh, professionals, yes. And sometimes these professionals are already well established, are, have great careers in law or other areas. So what do you think that attracts people to the Charter Institute and going through the challenging process to become a fellow? Well, it's my personal opinion that the courses that we offer are, in fact, the gold standard in terms of learning to be an arbitrator. And you, in fact, mentioned that they had well-established careers in law. Well, one can have a well-established career in law, but really not know how to be an arbitrator. And that includes those people who have appeared before tribunals on many, many occasions, because it's a different art. It's a different technique. And what we do is... We take it from the background of the arbitrator in your courses, for instance, the fellows course, you're given hypotheticals on how would you handle this particular issue if it arose? What would you do? And in terms of writing the award, that, that always causes a lot of people heartburn that they're going to have to write an award because most of them haven't had to draft an award or write or study for many, many years. But by writing that award, you have indicated that you have mastered what needs to be done to get an enforceable award, award. And as an arbitrator, that is your ultimate goal, is to have an enforceable award. And it doesn't matter how well you may be able to manage the proceeding, how well you may be able to handle any kind of hiccup that comes in to the proceeding. If you can't write an award that's enforceable, then in fact, you have failed and you remit to be an arbitrator. So I think that's what attracts a lot of professionals to the course is that they know that when they have finished, they're going to have those post nominals, which again, as Anthony has said, signals to the world that you've had certain training, that you have certain ethics, and that you will be able to conduct an arbitration correctly. Um, so I think that's what truly attracts people uh, to taking the, the courses, coupled with the fact, again, as Anthony said, it's not, it's not Anthony and me droning on to people, uh, to people. It is hypotheticals and situations thrown out and learning with each other so that at the end of the day, you are a well-rounded person ready to be an arbitrator. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, the thing I most remember from my Accelerated Route to Fellowship is exactly the concern, the preoccupation to write an enforceable award. This is the, the biggest lesson you take from it. And now every time I'm writing something, I have all this checklist and really this concern in writing something that will be enforceable later. Um, so, Anthony, picking up a topic uh, we mentioned earlier, and our, you already talked a little bit about it. Do you think the Charter Institute guidelines, protocols, and other resources have been useful in your practice and academic work? Oh, absolutely. Uh, relatively recently, I've made use of the uh, Charter Institute had a, a it's a discussion paper and also kind of guidelines on witness conferencing, what's sometimes known as hot tubbing. Very useful, very thoughtful uh, piece that I found helpful for something I was working on. And I find myself often going to the, uh, the, the I think it's guidelines, they call them, on interviewing arbitrators which is an invaluable resource really just to make sure that you're not going offside when you either are part of the team that's choosing an arbitrator or when somebody calls you uh, to give you advice on, well, how do I pick an arbitrator? So I've, I know I've made use of those two. And I, what I really like about the Chart Institute's approach to these is it's very practical. You know, you have a lot of articles that are written out there. In my day job, I do read quite a few articles, but they can take a long time to get to the point. What I like about the Chartered Institute's approach, it's it's really, it gets to the point and you can use it, which is why I return to them often. Uh, thank you, Anthony. And um, I, 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 um, Anne mentioned uh, a while ago that uh, we have at CIR um, more than 18,000 uh, professionals uh, in uh, we know they are uh, spread over uh, more than 150 countries, uh, 42 uh, national or regional branches. And uh, so we always say that by joining CIR, we become part of this huge uh, network. Uh, and, and that has been growing since 1915, right? Uh, in, your, in your experience, uh, how, how real is the international exchange within this uh, CIR network. It's quite real. And, and Anne's story about uh, the facts that she almost discarded, I think is such a, uh, in fact, I want to use that story and I will give you full, a uh, full, uh, I'll quote fully and give you full credit for it. But it's such a, such a perfect example of, of what this whole organization is about. I can tell you, I've already been or had exchanges and spoken uh, in, on conferences and panels, mostly virtually in the last little while, with chapters from the Caribbean, uh, from other, from the United States. Um, it, it, and that's only because of being a member of this Chartered Institute. It really, it is real. It's not like I'm technically a Canadian. I'm part of the Canadian branch. We don't just stay in the cold north. There really is a lot of exchange with different uh, different chapters around the world, and um, you know we get people joining our webinars. We join their webinars. It's really it's a it's a great community. Although the numbers seem quite large, it doesn't seem like such a huge organization. It's it's quite intimate, in fact, when you are uh, at, at these different events. I mean, just just take this for example. I, I'm expecting that, you know, also the event in Brazil, although I'll be zooming in, um, I, I'm very confident it's going to be quite intimate. Yeah, we, we had the same experience uh, in, in, in that the Brazil branch over the, the pandemic since 2020. Uh, and it has been uh, an incredible opportunity to uh, create all these bridges between the branches we have worked with uh, Dubai, we have worked with uh, with Southeast Asia and uh, in, in, in joint uh, joint programs. And um, I, I think we have learned a lot uh, from this experience in terms of using uh, the, all these all this opportunity that this large uh, network of professionals provides. Uh, and, and, and I would like to uh, ask you um, a question that has to do with your 
work, uh, your active uh, work in promoting diversity in, in ADR. Um, during your presidency last year, uh, in 2021, uh, CIRB started to implement its global three-year strategy to advance issues like diversity, inclusion, sustainability, and uh, other uh, very important goals. Um, how much do you think we have improved and how important uh, is this continuing effort? Well, of course, I think it's very important, as you can tell from the fact that I'm a founding member of Arbitral Women, which this was the result of us looking around and realizing there was only a handful of women uh, at any conference. But diversity is much more than men and women. It is geographical diversity. It is race ge uh, diversity. It is age diversity, um, a variety of things. And you mentioned the fact that during the pandemic and we went on Zoom for webinars and the like, the pandemic has also helped us achieve greater diversity because it's allowing us to reach out to corners that we might not have been able to reach out in the past. One of the things that the Institute did, in, did put in place this last year is its mentoring program in which more seasoned members of the Institute mentor younger members via Zoom around the world to allow them to bring along their career and give them opportunities that they might not have otherwise. There's also been the outreach to students. Uh, there's a student membership, which is free. And so over the years, the membership of the Chartered Institute has changed from the five men who established it, which were two solicitors, an architect, a surveyor, and a, I'm sorry, I can never remember what the fifth one was, <laughs> uh, but all men in 1915 to now this past year, we had back-to-back -back female presidents for the first time. So the Institute is thriving in terms of members and that membership base is growing more diverse with every day due to the efforts that have been put in place. Thank you. We we had a very interesting experience in Brazil with the mentorship that you mentioned. Uh, in, uh, uh, we had a group of maybe 45 fellows that were paired with uh, associate and student members. And that actually led to uh, a book of articles that each pair uh, wrote and that's going to be launched in, in the next few months. And uh, that's all um, an initiative of the young members group of the CIR Brazil branch. Well, we, we are coming to the end of our, of our program. Um, I would like to thank once more uh, Anne Ryan Robertson, Anthony Damesis uh, for being here uh, with us for this interview and for uh, attending as discussion leaders as you learned from Anthony, discussion leaders uh, that uh, will conduct uh, our fellowship program in October. And I, I would like to uh, invite you to, uh, on the one hand, um, follow uh, CIR Brazil on social media uh, and visit our website and learn more about CIR in Brazil and about the fellowship program. And um, I would also invite you to join us again next week on August 31st at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Brasilia time uh, for an interview with two other uh, fac faculty members, uh, discussion leaders that will be here uh, with us in October. Uh, David Hübner from uh, California and Jennifer Alfaro from Uruguay. So with this, thank you again. I hope to see you again here uh, next time. And um, uh, have a nice evening, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.